They were supposed to be the villains, the Philistines, uncircumcised giants, tormentors of Samson, enemies of Israel, and symbols of foreign corruption. The Bible names them again and again, tracing them back to a mysterious island called Kafter. To most modern ears, that just meant myth, a convenient backstory, a moral enemy drawn in black and white. But what if that part was true? For decades, archaeology scoffed at the idea. No hard evidence of an overseas origin, just pottery, just story. The consensus was simple. These were locals with foreign flair. Nothing more. Until 2019, in a lab lit by the cold glow of a genome sequencer, the bloodline of the Philistines spoke for the first time in 3,000 years. Ancient DNA, pulled from bones beneath the soil of Ashkelon, and in those strands, a silent confession, they weren't from here. They were from the sea. Aegean genes. Bronze Age Crete. The same world as Mycenaean kings and Minoan priests. Not a myth. Not a metaphor. A migration. The irony is sharp. These so-called enemies, these foreign invaders of the Bible, were themselves survivors of collapse. Fleeing a world in flames, sailing east in desperation. The last embers of the Aegean, carried in children's bones. But here's the twist. Their DNA vanishes. Just two centuries later, it's gone. The same cities, the same graves, but the genetic trail evaporates. How does a people arrive so boldly, and then disappear so completely? Not by war, not by extinction, by blending. And yet, their story didn't end there. Because to understand what happened next, the fusion, the forgetting, the rituals they refused to abandon, we must return to where the truth first surfaced to a field of dust, a cemetery lost for millennia, to the bones buried beneath the city of ashes, Ashkelon. It started with a scent, faint, sweet, still lingering in the soil after 3,000 years. Ashkelon, 2013. A team brushes aside the dust of centuries and stumbles onto silence. A cemetery, forgotten by history, untouched by looters. Beneath the sand, 150 graves. No war trophies, no mass burials, just individuals, families, and then the children. For infants, buried beneath the floors of homes. Not warriors, not intruders, babies, laid to rest beneath clay walls, beside cooking fires. Wrapped in care, not conquest. Their tiny bones, still clutched amulets, beads, traces of scented oil. It shattered everything, because when the genomes were sequenced, the silence spoke. Inside those fragile remains was a signal no one expected. 14% European ancestry. Aegean genes, foreign blood, right here, in the heart of ancient Canaan. A ghost marker, glowing like a flare in a Levantine genome. This wasn't a local population. This was a new one, arrived from somewhere far beyond the shoreline. And it wasn't just a few travelers. These weren't mercenaries or marauders passing through. These children were born here, which means their parents had settled, built homes, brought their rituals, buried their dead the way their ancestors had, with perfume, with jewelry, with meaning. But none of it matched the world outside. To their neighbors, they must have seemed alien, unfamiliar gods, foreign food, strange names whispered in the market. And yet, they lived side by side, brick by brick, breath by breath. The newcomers rooted themselves into the land. Still, one question burned hotter than all the rest. Where had they come from? Because buried inside the European signal was a story even older than Ashkelon. A journey across a sea in collapse. A flight from a crumbling homeland. A bloodline carved by fire, famine, and exile. But to trace it, we have to go deeper. To the island the Bible called Kafter. To the genome that matched, almost perfectly, with Bronze Age Crete. For centuries, Kafter was just a word, a biblical footnote, a hazy island from which, it was said, the Philistines came. Crete, some scholars whispered, but most shrugged. Myth, metaphor, nothing concrete, until now. Because inside the DNA of those Ashkelon infants was a ghost, a precise genetic fingerprint. Not just Southern Europe, not just the Aegean. No, this was specific. A 43% match to a genome pulled from Bronze Age Crete. Odigitria underscore BA.
a buried girl from a vanished world. Her blood echoed, unmistakably, in the bones of Philistine children. And suddenly, the Bible wasn't wrong. Kafta was real. The skeptics had missed it. Oral tradition had remembered. It raises a deeper question, doesn't it? What else have we forgotten? That someone, somewhere, never truly let go. Because the match wasn't just genetic. It was cultural, too. The figurines found in Philistine homes, goddess icons with raised arms, echoes of Aegean shrines, the pottery, Mycenaean in form, local in clay, painted swallows, spirals, foreign patterns reshaped by foreign hands now rooted in Levantine soil, and pork, forbidden to their neighbors, yet central on Philistine plates, a quiet rebellion, or a clung to memory. You can feel it, can't you? These weren't generic migrants. They brought their world with them. And for a time, they made it live again. But no voyage begins without a reason. Crete wasn't empty. It wasn't abandoned. It was a cradle of gods and kings. Palaces like labyrinths. Art like prophecy. So why leave? What force tears people from a home like that? Because if they didn't come by choice, then something darker must have chased them. And to find out what? We need to leave the shores of Canaan. And watch the Aegean burn. It didn't start in Ashkelon. It started with fire. Around 1200 BCE, the world cracked open. The palaces of Mycenae gone. Roofs collapsed. Walls scorched black. The Hittite Empire, once vast and unshakable, vanished almost overnight. Egypt, even mighty Egypt, stood trembling on its heels, fending off wave after wave of attackers from the sea. But this wasn't an invasion in the way textbooks describe. This was an unraveling. Climate shifted. Crops failed. Famine clawed its way through the Aegean. Drought tightened its grip like a vice. Families packed everything they owned into boats, not to conquer, but to escape, to survive. And from this chaos rose a name, etched into the stones of Medinet Habu, in the shadow of Ramesses III. Pele set, a foreign people from their islands. Seaborne, armed, desperate. Egypt saw them as a threat. But what if they were something else? What if they were the aftermath? What if the Philistines weren't aggressors, but orphans of a fallen world? It reframes everything. They weren't here to pillage. They were here to begin again. Imagine the moment. Sails on the horizon. Foreign silhouettes stepping onto Levantine sand, carrying fragments of a culture that no longer existed anywhere else. The last embers of the Aegean, flickering in a new land. Hungry. Haunted and unwilling to be forgotten. And yet, this raises a deeper question. When they arrived on Canaan's shores, how were they received? Did they storm the cities, clash with locals, rewrite the land by sword? Or did something else unfold? Because buried beneath the battlefield myths is a whisper of peace, a clue hidden in the architecture, in the shared diets, in the borrowed gods. And to uncover it, we'll have to enter a world where identity itself begins to blur. From a distance, it looked like Canaan. Stone streets. Mud brick homes. Market noise rising with the heat. But step inside, and something felt off. Ashkelon, Gath, Ekron. Cities that looked Levantine on the surface, but pulsed with an unfamiliar rhythm. Aegean hearts beating in Canaanite bodies. The walls bore spiral motifs, sharp-angled patterns, unmistakably Mycenaean. But the clay beneath your feet, dug from local soil fired in local kills, the foreign and the native, baked together into every brick, walk into a kitchen, and the contradiction gets louder. There's pork on the fire, rare, almost taboo in this land, next to cumin and poppy seeds, imports, luxuries, and yet somehow now dinner, rituals that once belonged to islands across the sea, now served at Levantine tables. In the temples, it gets stranger still. Two horned altars stand like sentinels, half Cypriot, half Canaanite, symbols stacked in unfamiliar grammar, a shrine to gods that may have never had names, just shapes, passed from one coastline to another like a language only the ruins remember. These weren't just settlements. They were cultural mosaics, cities that absorbed and adapted, stitched together by the hands of migrants and locals, side by side. No single flag, no singular past. And that's the part no one saw coming. Because while the pottery evolved, while the art bloomed in this hybrid form, something else was fading. The genes. 
Within two centuries, the European ancestry, the same Aegean signature that once lit up the DNA of Ashkelon's infants, vanishes completely, absorbed, erased, or simply replaced. So what happened? How does a people leave behind their gods, their graves, their gods again, but not their blood? Where did the Aegean go? Because if identity can survive without genetics, maybe the real story isn't in what they brought, but in what they chose to keep. They came with the sea in their blood. Aegean faces, foreign rituals, buried under Ashkelon's sun. A people who once left their genetic fingerprint in every bone, every baby. And then it's gone. By the time we reach the later Iron Age, the DNA shifts. The same cities. The same graves. But the blood tells a different story. No trace of Crete. No echo of Mycenae. Just Canaan. It's as if the Aegean was never here but we know it was. We've held it in our hands, in spiral-painted pottery, in pork bones burned for a feast, in figurines carved with old gods. So what happened? How can a people disappear from the genome, but not from the ground? It's a paradox, a delusion, one so rapid it defies expectations. Two generations, that's all it took. A child grows up speaking a mother's tongue, marries into a local family, and their grandchild is someone else. Someone Levantine in code, but still Philistine in name, because the temples still stood, the rituals still circled, the feasts still followed a calendar older than the soil beneath them. The blood changed, but the story didn't, which forces us to ask, was identity ever about biology, or is it something else, something we pass, not in cells, but in choices? Maybe culture isn't inherited, maybe it's remembered, but memory is fragile. So what does it take to preserve it? To carry a ghost culture through centuries of change? Because if the genome forgets, something else has to hold the line. And to find out what? We have to look not at the bones, but at the rituals they refused to bury. They blended their bloodlines, but not their gods. Step inside a Philistine home, even a century after their DNA disappeared, and you'd still feel it. A spiral painted on a jug. A hearth raised, just like they built in Crete. A small clay goddess, arms lifted in the air, silent, defiant, familiar only to those who crossed the sea. These weren't just decorations. They were declarations. Because when bloodlines vanished into the Levant, culture stayed behind and stared back. Their burials tell you everything. Not pits, not ashes, but carved tombs, built for individuals. Each with offerings, oil, beads, perfume jars. Objects not just for mourning but for memory. Even in death, they refused to become someone else. And in life, the table told the truth. Pork, forbidden in Israelite towns, sacred in their own. As the region shifted, and new laws crept into kitchens, they didn't flinch. The food, the tools, the quiet rituals passed between generations. They held on, like whispers through fire. Because identity, once burned into daily life, doesn't vanish with a surname. It lingers in what you do when no one is watching. Even the language bent around them. Names like Achish and Goliath show up in both potsherds and parables. Their alphabet, borrowed from neighbors, but spelling stories only they understood. A foreign people in native clothes. Blended by marriage, divided by memory. But memory has limits. And the world around them was changing. Because just as they finished carving a new identity from borrowed stone, a different kind of fire was on the horizon. Not from ships, not from drought, from armies, empires rising, with scrolls, with soldiers, with gods that tolerated no rivals. So the question isn't whether the Philistines remembered who they were. It's whether the world let them. It ended the way it began with fire. 604 BC. Ashkelon burns. Not the slow erosion of culture, not the quiet fade of rituals, but flame. Babylon came like a hammer, not to conquer but to erase. Ekron fell. Gath was already gone. Gaza barely flickered. Philistia, the land of five cities, the stage of centuries, silenced in a single campaign. And this time, there was no refuge, no ships waiting in the harbor, no sea to cross. The empire didn't ask who they were. It didn't care. It took the grain, the silver, the children, and then buried the rest. In Babylon, a few families remained survivors in exile, ghosts walking through someone else's kingdom, 
No temples. No tombs. Just memory, raw, fragile, unrecorded. And then, even that went quiet. The name Philistine faded from scrolls, from maps, from mouths. The tribe who once brought the Aegean to the Levant, erased not by war, not by time, but by power. After 500 years of fusion, defiance, adaptation, nothing. No homeland. No bloodline left to trace. Just silence. But the land didn't forget. Ashkelon's ruins held something. Not gold. Not bones. Just a potsherd. Cracked. Ordinary. And yet, scratched into the clay. Two names. Names no one expected. Because while empires may silence a people, sometimes a single piece of pottery speaks louder than a king. Goliath was never supposed to be real. He was a symbol of threat, of otherness, of a war between chosen and cursed. A towering Philistine, mocked from pulpits, feared from scrolls. His name became shorthand for everything the Israelites weren't. But then, someone found a potsherd. Buried in Gath, the city of giants, the city of his birth, was a fragment of clay. Faded. Broken. Forgotten. And on it a name. Not exactly Goliath, but close. Strikingly close. The consonants, the structure, not a one-off. Not coincidence. A common Philistine name. Which means something staggering. It wasn't just a story. It was a memory. Because Goliath, or someone like him, may have lived, may have walked those same stones, breathed that same air, died in a battle not recorded for glory, but for grief. And suddenly, scripture isn't myth, it's archaeology. The divide between legend and life collapses. Because the giants weren't giants. They were men. Flesh and bone. Just taller, maybe. Just foreign. And when the bloodlines vanished, when Babylon scattered their children, the names remained, clinging to ceramics, buried in ruins, whispered in the roots of later languages. It's a kind of immortality. You can erase a people's country, crush their cities, burn their gods. But names, names are stubborn. They survive in lullabies, in curses, in the lines of enemies retelling old wars, even when no one remembers who they belong to. Which leads to the real question. Now that we've found them again, in clay, in bone, in genome, can we ever truly lose them again? You can bury a people. You can crush their cities, scatter their bones, silence their songs. But somehow, their story keeps breathing. The Philistines didn't vanish because of war, or failure, or forgetting. They vanished in the blood. Two hundred years after they arrived, their DNA dissolved into the Levant, blended, swallowed erased by the mathematics of time. The genome let them go. But the land didn't. Not the pottery. Not the temples. Not the rituals repeated by children who no longer knew why. Only that they mattered. Because culture is stubborn like that. It outlives borders. It slips past conquest. It whispers in kitchens, in funerals, in the way a name is said, and how a fire is built. You can lose your ancestors, but not their echo. You can lose your homeland but not the rhythm of how they walked it. And what DNA forgets, memory sometimes refuses to. So the question turns, slowly, onto us. What would your genome say about you? Where your blood once traveled? What winds carried your great-grandparents across oceans or deserts? And what would it leave out? Because DNA is data. But it isn't destiny. It can trace where you came from, but not why they left, or what they hoped, or who they held when they died. That part. That's carried in ritual, in resistance, in the invisible thread between who you were told you are and who you feel you might be. If this spoke to something in you, a name, a place, a longing, subscribe. There are more stories like this and more ghosts waiting to speak. Next time, we follow another forgotten migration out of Anatolia and into the heart of the Levant.